In this interview, it's all about Photoshop and Photoshop alternatives. This is Twitter. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today on the show, I have my friend, Aaron Mays here. Aaron Mays is from a little tiny company called Flurn, uh, Photoshop Learning. It's a, you know, a concatenation of those two terms. But uh, Aaron knows a thing or two about Photoshop and compositing and retouching and all that. So I thought it'd be good. We, we sort of brainstormed about what would be the, the the most impactful thing to talk about on this show um, now that I have them on the hot seat? And I thought it would be the comparison. You know, in this case, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the differences and the alternatives to Photoshop, or should you just stick with Photoshop as the industry standard going forward? So the the correct person to ask this is this guy, Aaron Nays. Aaron, welcome to the show, man. It's a pleasure to have you on again. Thanks so much, Frederick. So good to be here, man. Yeah, I'm excited about our little demo today and talking about the state of the industry because a lot has changed over the last couple of years. We've got a lot of new exciting options out there. And I think for the first time in history, we have real competitors to Photoshop, things that you know I would say a professional could uh, could use in their workflow and uh the, you know, depending on what your price point is, I think these could be, you know, real options for a lot of listeners. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And that's, that's the exciting piece of it. Because, but it, from my standpoint, it's exciting and intimidating because you want to jump into this stuff and sort of pick a horse and ride it, right? Because like you, when I watch your tutorials, which are fantastic, by the way, um, when I watch, yeah, I watch your tutorials and you've got the hot keys down and it's, you're, you're playing music and chords <laughs> and, you know, it, when, when you're editing a photo, it's not like, okay, file this, let me do this. You're, you're playing the photo, you're playing the image to build up that hot key muscle memory. You got to pick an app and stick with it, right? You know, surprisingly, okay, so Photoshop has obviously been around for a lot of years, and these new players, uh, and Affinity Photo is what we're going to be taking a look at today. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how this worked exactly, but they basically just took a lot of Photoshop and just duplicated it. And like legally, I'm not sure what happened there, but like a lot of the keyboard shortcuts are actually the exact same as well, which is like... Kind of mind blowing to me. I started using Affinity Photo and, you know, just like by habit going back to the same keyboard shortcuts. And I'm like, oh, they're literally the exact same in Affinity Photo, uh, which is great for me and anyone making that transition and someone who's already used the keyboard shortcuts. Not to mention you can change your keyboard shortcuts uh, to, to match your editing style as well. So uh, surprisingly, the transition is is not that difficult of a transition. Uh it's mostly just a user interface. Uh, once you get over the fact that things are look a little bit different and you know in slightly different places, um, it's a it's kind of like a one to one. It, it's almost like a copy paste of Photoshop, which is pretty surprising to me. Photoshop definitely has some technology that the other programs just do not have, uh, mm -hmm. which makes sense. It's been around for a long, long time. But you know, I would say for the majority of photo editing you're going to be able to do what you need to do in these other programs. Yeah. And that, that's, that's also part of the, you know, the, the, I don't know, the, the decision-making process when you're sort of thinking about, you know, which, which app should I put my, my money and invest my time into? Um, yeah, they're, they're very similar. In fact, I had the, the CEO or the managing director from Seraphon, the company that makes affinity photo. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I asked him was, you know, it, the five million pound elephant in the room is why would someone want to go with your application when there's the industry standard Photoshop? Photoshop is part of our lexicon now. Affinity Photo is not part of our lexicon. You know, if you put Photoshop on your resume, the person reading it ins instantly knows what that means. If you put Affinity Photo on there, you know, it's an app, even though, like you said, they have parody. Um, but in his response to that was, and I, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are. His response was, uh, they were able to stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And build this new application without the legacy uh, code and processes and learnings that went along with the, the decades of Photoshop. 
So they kind of started from today. This I'm paraphrasing what he said. They started from today and built a modern version of Photoshop versus having to build onto legacy code to satisfy users that demand this obscure feature. Do you, I mean, when you playing with both apps, do you, do you, do you feel that? Is it, does it feel modern and new? Or like you said, is it just a, a rubber stamp of Photoshop without, without much difference? I mean, I, I definitely, there's a, there is definite like value and legitimacy in that statement, you know, like building something on a modern not. Uh, for a modern audience using modern technology. And I think with Affinity Photo, the real advantage is their uh, tablet software. You know, they have Affinity Photo for the desktop computer, but you can also get it on your iPad. And that's where I think, you know, building something in 2019 for the current technology, I think that's really the, the biggest feature there is that the app is basically just like pairs very well from desktop editing to tablet editing. Mm -hmm. Now, Photoshop is coming out with a tablet version of Photoshop. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with the beta version as of us talking right now. It's not a public release and it is very good. Uh, but I think Affinity Photo being able to develop both their desktop and their tablet application at the same time, you know, there's a, a definite benefit from from doing that. Um, yeah. Affinity Photo, in in my opinion, I mean the features are there, and it it is it is done in a in a good, um, you know, the program as far as I've used it, I haven't experienced major bugs or crashes or, or things that just don't work. Um, I think the user interface is pretty solid. Uh, I think it there's just a couple things where I'm like, why did they do it like this? But you know that could just be because I'm used to using Photoshop for years and years. Um, and I think a person new to Photoshop or new to Affinity Photo uh, would basically have the same learning curve to get into either one of the programs. Yeah, and that's interesting. But the, if, you, if you take the learning curve piece out of it or that, that variable out of it, one of the other big variables, of course, is pricing. Yes. Right. So with Photoshop, you're committing to the Creative Cloud. One of the, the ten poles that Affinity stands on or Serif stands on is you know, it's like the old days, you give us some money, we give you the bits. And if we update it, <laughs> you know, we update fractions, you get those for free. If we update whole numbers, then, you know, there's a fee probably discounted from what new purchasers would, would uh, have to pay from a, you know, obviously you're, you're the expert in this, but putting on your newbie hat and starving artist hat, right? The, for the people that want to get to, from where they are now to where Aaron Nace is, that's, I think that's the question. It's expensive, you know, no matter how you define it, right? It's more expensive to use Photoshop than it is to use some of the competitors out there, Infinity included. Should the starving artist start, especially considering the parody that you mentioned, should the starving artist start with Affinity since it's about the same, get going, and then with an eye towards later when I can afford it and I'm more successful, I should transition into Photoshop? Or should they just suck it up and start with Photoshop now because that's what they're going to be using. Or, you know, the third tier, third leg in that tripod is, will Affinity someday surpass Photoshop as the de facto compositing, retouching standard application? What do, what do you think? So I would say it depends on what you're interested in. Uh, for instance, if you plan on doing video editing and maybe some vector-based work, uh, other programs within Adobe's Creative Cloud, like Adobe Premiere, which is used for video editing, Illustrator for vectors. If you do plan on working with these other types of applications, then it could be a good idea to go ahead and invest in the Adobe system because those apps do play really well together. Uh, if you plan on mostly just doing photo editing, uh, I would say that Affinity Photo is is a really good option out there. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it it's a it's a full build. This is not like a light version of a photo editing application. It's you know it's very feature rich. And if you know budget is a is a big issue, you know like that's a big concern. Then I would say go with what you can afford. You know yeah, yeah. the most important thing is like using these tools, right? Like you can get a great camera in your hands, but if you're not out shooting day in and day out and developing your skills, it 
you know, a great camera sitting on your shelf isn't going to produce great pictures. You know, an inexpensive camera in your hands day in and day out is going to produce much better pictures than the most expensive camera in the world sitting on your shelf. So I would say, you know, the most important thing is like using the software, getting creative, like doing what you want to do with it and, you know, sticking with the price point that works for you. So I think Affinity Photo really is a good option for those beginners out there. And I would say, you know, for most photo editors, that's probably all they would need to ever get. I I would say that, you know, if you start with Affinity Photo and it works for you, I, I wouldn't think of many applications in which you would need to move into Photoshop to be able to do what you want to do. Uh, that being said, Affinity Photo does export out as PSDs. So if you ever did want to bring some of those files directly into Photoshop, you'd be able to do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. You have a, the other piece of that before we dive into, cause I want to have you, I know you're queued up to show us some stuff. Uh, before we do that, I wanted to just get your thoughts on, you are an educator, obviously mm -hmm. you're an educator, photographer, retoucher, compositing artist, you know, you know, <laughs> long list of titles, uh, you know, that go along with who Aaron Nace is, but Flurn, you know, like we said at the beginning is Photoshop learning, you know, that's what, that's what the, the, the name stands for. Are we going to see additional tutorials in there for Photoshop competitors in your library? Like, uh, you know, affinity photo and the others as those apps get traction, or are you going to stick with Photoshop and be specific there? Yeah. You know, so Flurn is, uh, my background is actually in photography Yeah. and and also in Photoshop. So Flurn is kind of like, you know, photography starts with a PH too, right? So oh, right, um, right. Flurn, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's kind of like Photo Learn, you know, that's, that's you know, where the name, Photoshop is a part of that. Photography is a part of that. Yeah. Um, and at this point, I just, I want Flurn to just be a word on its own, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> so whatever we teach, it, it can totally come into the umbrella of Flurn. So uh, you know, my goal as an educator and as a business owner is to go where the uh, go where people go where the, the my students are going. You know, if there is a massive shift towards other applications, I'm definitely happy to teach those. And we've taught different applications on Flurn. We have an entire suite of Lightroom tutorials on Flurn. We even have tutorials teaching you how to composite images using mobile applications. We did a wow fantastic tutorial with a guest instructor, Elise Swopes. She's on Instagram at Swopes, S-W-O-P-E-S. -E Check her out because she's doing awesome stuff. And she is editing from start to finish amazing composite photos using just her phone. So wow. we had her in the studio and she produced with us a full length tutorial on compositing using iPhone apps. So we are most definitely interested in moving with the future, like wherever, you know, wherever the artist is going, we're going to be there to provide education for them. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. See, I was hoping you'd say that because I, I need to see your take on stuff. You have a way of, of teaching that makes things feel accessible and doable you know, versus complex and, and unknowable. Yeah. <laughs> so I need that, those skills applied to everything. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank cool. You, you want to dive in? I know you're queued up to show these these applications. I'd love to see what you, uh, what you have planned for us today. Let's do it. Let's do it. So we're going to start off in Photoshop and we're going to, uh, we're basically going to remove some objects in Photoshop and then we're going to do the same thing in Affinity Photo. So you can get an idea of how these different programs work and this is just a it's a very common scenario where you've got you know some distractions in your image and we want to get rid of them so we're going to start off here in photoshop so let's go ahead and grab uh photoshop and we've got a ballet dancer a beautiful photograph here this is from a stock image website called unsplash and i want to start about removing these light poles in the background you can see we've got a few light poles here in the background and I've got this one here up at the very top right as well. So what we're going to do in Photoshop, we're going to start by creating a new layer. Okay, there we go, down here on the bottom right. And we're going to go to the Spot Healing Brush Tool. Okay, so our Spot Healing Brush Tool looks like a big Band-Aid right over here on the left-hand side. And we want to make sure that our type is set to Content Aware. What that's going to do is it's going to search out for similar areas in our image and fill it in with that content. And we want to make sure at the top 
we click on sample all layers, that allows me to do this on a new layer. So with this tool, it's actually incredibly easy to remove objects. Basically, I just have to paint over the objects that I want to remove, and Photoshop is going to look for similar areas in the image and fill it in with that content. Now, it doesn't always do a perfect job because it is one of these automatic type tools, but you can always just paint over it again. Now, we're going to go over like easy use cases for this tool, okay? Yeah. Stuff when the background is relatively simple. And then here, when we get closer to our subject, we're going to possibly use a couple different tools, depending on how this does. So you can see there very quickly and easily. Let's just remove some stuff in the parking lot here, too. Very quickly and easily, I'm able to remove these background poles. Now, granted, they're on a relatively simple background, and the tool can do a good job in these simple situations. Let's see how it does here when we get closer to the ballet dancer's leg. I'm going to try to remove that pole. Uh, it did do it. It did reconstruct her leg, but it didn't do a perfect job there. Okay, not a perfect job. Obviously, we've got a little bit of a weird looking leg there. And that's just, you know, I mean, it did preserve the line. That's fantastic. But it doesn't know, hey, this is a leg and it should look like this. So what we're going to do in this case is I'm going to create a new layer. We're going to hit S for the clone stamp tool. Now, the clone stamp tool will just make a direct copy of wherever you sample. And the benefits of the clone stamp tool is that it doesn't try to blend anything. There's no automatic software going on. It's just a direct copy. You have to paint in and sample a little bit. Like There's a little bit more manual work that goes into using the clone stamp. But with that manual work comes a little bit more control. So... You know, when we get to these tight areas, there we go. It makes a lot of sense to use the clone stamp tool. And you can see I clone stamped away from the leg and the ballet uh, dress there. And then this area, which is, again, pretty easy because it's not surrounded by anything important. I'll just go back in with that spot healing brush tool, paint it over and remove that. You make that look so easy, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> No, I know uh, you're using you're using a Wacom tablet there, right? Yeah, I, I am using a pressure sensitive tablet and keep in mind that um I love, love, love Photoshop and I've spent many years with this program. So um but you know, with a little bit of practice, anyone could do this. And I do believe that. Uh so let's go ahead and use a clone stamp tool. She's got a necklace that kind of is, you know, coming up near her face there. It's a little bit distracting there too. So let's go ahead and clone stamp that out. Okay, J for our spot healing brush tool. Anything that's on a relatively simple background and not, you know, not in direct competition with any other objects, the spot healing brush tool is the way to go. Wow. And you're doing that on a on a separate layer. So I see you're on layer two there. So those yeah. the clone the, the the pixels that you're adding in are being added onto layer two and sampling from the background layer, correct? Exactly. So check this out. I can turn this off and on at any time. Nice. Even when I save this out. So I'll save this out as a PSD. And you know, if you want to get back to the original photo straight out of camera, you just turn those layers off. This is what we've got straight out of camera turn it back on, and here's our image with all those distractions removed. Wow. So and that's a, that if the client says, you know what, we the, those light poles in the background are really important to us. Can you put those back in? <laughs> yeah, you just <laughs> <laughs> put that layer back on and say, okay, light poles are back in. It's not a problem. Or say, yeah, it's going to take me a couple hours to put those back in. I'll have to bill you for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's your business mind work and yeah exactly. definitely i can i can do anything you want just uh you know let me let me send you my estimate first and you decide if you want me to go for it exactly exactly so, it's general. interesting that you said because the 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 healing brush versus the clone stamp tool i think a lot of people myself included just sort of default to the clone stamp tool because i i don't know because it it showed up before the the healing brush, right? <laughs> it came first. It came first. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, every once once you understand how to work a hammer, everything becomes a nail. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so is from your standpoint, being the Photoshop expert, is the the healing brush tool an evolution of clone stamp, like a just a smart version of the clone stamp tool, or is it just something completely different? It is. It is an evolution. It's a fantastic tool, and I would say the the uses for the spot healing brush tool because it has content aware technology built into it. Uh, anytime you want to remove something that's on a relatively simple background, the spot healing brush tool is the way to go. If you have some little bit more of a complex background or you have like defined edges, for instance, you know, we, we showed this earlier, this light pole that I wanted to remove, right? It's on a relatively simple background. It's just mostly like dark looking trees, right? Yeah. So you, this is a perfect opportunity for the spot healing brush tool because Photoshop can say, oh, there's, you know, dark trees right there in the background. I'll just sample some other dark trees from around the image and put them right there to cover this up, you know? Well, why would, why wouldn't you make a selection around there and just say content aware fill? Or is that just two ways to get, you know, of getting to the same destination? You could most definitely use content aware fill. I find that the spot healing brush tool works a little bit better than content aware fill. Mm. Uh, also, you can, it, I find it's much easier to just go over an area because sometimes, keep in mind, these tools are automatic. You know, they try to figure everything out for you. And sometimes they do a great job, but sometimes they miss. And, you know, if there's a little bit of a miss with the spot healing brush tool, you just paint over that area again and there's a good chance it's going to do a better job. So uh, content aware fill, let's just create a new layer here. We're going to just create a lasso selection. Notice I have my layers off where I removed objects. Mm -hmm. There we go. So let's go ahead and make a selection around this light post. I'm going to hit shift delete, which is my keyboard shortcut for the fill dialog. And we're going to go to content aware and hit OK. There we go. Now this is another... Uh, drawback of content aware fill is that I can't actually do this on a new layer. I, I have to do this on the, my background layer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. And for that reason, um, for that reason, I tend to not use this tool as much because I am always trying to do every step in Photoshop as non-destructive as possible. In other words, I want to do every Every single edit, every single change I make, I want it to be on a new layer so I can turn this off or on at any point in time. And this has to do with things like retouching, object removal, coloring, all of these changes. I want to be on a new layer. That way I can save this out as a layered file. And years from now, if needed, I can come back and I can say, you know what, let's put these lap posts back in. Or you know what, maybe I want this necklace or whatever back in. Usually it's not big changes like that. A lot of the time it's like coloring or lighting. Like mm -hmm. maybe I'll edit a photo and I'll, I'll think the colors look really good. And then I'll look at it like a day or two later and be like, oh, you know what? I actually, it's like too green. And it, it can be difficult to see those things when you're editing. But usually taking a little bit of a break, coming back to look at your photo later, you'll start to see like, mm, you know what? It's a little too green. So you go back in your file, maybe lower the opacity of that layer where you did a little bit of color balancing and you're good to go. So it takes very little bit of time to go back there and make some changes. Yeah. Also, if you're in the learning phases where you're just like trying things out and learning how you do things, it's very helpful to save out layered files because sometimes you kind of forget what you did. Like, oh, I really like the lighting effect or I really like the coloring I did on this image but I have no idea what I did. Like, I just don't remember. So you can go back into your layered files, take a look at the layer that affected the color or affected the light. For instance, let's go ahead. I'm going to make a levels adjustment here. We'll just grab a levels adjustment layer. I'm going to go to my blue channel and I'm going to pull some blues into the shadows. Just a very little bit. Can you see that? Like a mm -hmm. tiny bit of blues into the shadows and a little bit of warm colors into my highlight, give us a little bit of a duo tone there. So let's turn this off and on. It's a very subtle effect. Yeah. A little bit of a coloring effect. And you might like that sort of thing, but maybe you forgot how to do it. So saving a layered file is very beneficial because you can actually go back and pull this in. Not only that, you could actually pull this exact same levels adjustment layer 
from one image to another. So if you had a series of photos, you could have them all colored in the exact same way. And that's a mask as well, right? So you could you could just paint that correction in to certain areas of the image if you wanted to, correct? Definitely, yeah. You've got a layer mask built into any adjustment layer in Photoshop. So if you wanted only certain areas of the photo to be brighter or darker, let's say we do, I'm gonna do one more here. We're just gonna do a color balance adjustment layer, okay? I'm gonna pop a little bit more red and a little bit more yellow into this, okay? So we've got this color balance adjustment layer here. Mm -hmm. But we'll say maybe I don't want that to be visible everywhere. I'm going to invert the layer mask to make it invisible. And then I'm going to use my gradient tool. We're just going to use a radial gradient and a foreground to transparent color. So uh, what I'm going to do is click and drag outward in this direction here. And my layer mask now looks like this. So this effect that I made, that warming effect, is not visible in these darker areas, but it is visible in the lighter areas. So I just, you know, I just drug out, there we go, I'll do it again, just drug out a gradient going from white to transparent. And now I've got this warming effect. We can see it here. Wow. Kept it nice and simple, but we have a nice warming effect here. And then I could even go back into this adjustment layer and I'll say, you know what, give me even more red. You know, let's make it even more yellow for, for, you know, more of a, a bold statement on color there. So I can turn that off and on at any time. I can go back in here. I can change the properties. I could add green to it or, you know, whatever I wanted there as well. And this is, at, at, you know, I can save this document out, come back in here, and I could turn both of these off and say, you know what, I like the original coloring. Or, you know what, maybe I like this warm, but I'm not too hot about this blue that I added. So you can make any of these changes at any time or get back to your original photograph. I love that. And that, that's part of, I mean, that's a lot of the power there, right? Because the, the power of adjustment layers, the power of masking those adjustment layers, and the, the power to sort of rewind back in time um, and experiment and do different variations without without affecting the underlying image. I think that's, that's huge. Based on, you know, I don't know if you remember back in Photoshop 2, that, <laughs> that was before layers were introduced, right? And it was a, okay, let me save a different version with a different name. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah. Layers are a fantastic, fantastic, uh, you know, way to keep your options open. You know, I very rarely will undo steps in Photoshop what I do instead is every time I'm going to create something new, I just create a new layer. That way I can just turn that layer off and on at any point in time. Love it. Love it. Okay. So here's the, here's the million dollar question now. So can you replicate what you were doing here on this image in Photoshop in Affinity Photo? Do we have adjustment layers with layer masks and all that magic? Or do I have to give those up and, and figure out an entirely new workflow? All right, well, let's see. We're going to switch to Affinity Photo right now. Okay. okay, so here we are in Affinity Photo, and we have a lot of the same tools. So obviously, the layout looks a little bit different, but we're going to just start off on the same, we're going to start off with the same uh, set of steps. So we're going to go to our Layers panel right here, and you can see we have our background. I've got Opacity in here. I've got Blending Modes. We've got a lot of the same tools. Let's go ahead and create a new layer here. So this is a new pixel layer. And then I wanna go ahead and find a brush tool. So I'm gonna to go to my healing brush tool. Okay, we've got our healing brush, patch tool, the blemish removal tool. We're just gonna go right to our healing brush tool and see how this does. So a lot of our keyboard shortcuts are actually the same, which is fantastic. So if I hold down the space bar, there we go. It's actually going to tell me some keyboard shortcuts down here on the bottom, which I really do like. So holding nice. down this uh, space bar, it tells me drag to pan the view and then hold command to enter the zoom mode. And when I'm holding command, it's going to tell me what to do down here. So I, I do like this information bar. So I'm going to just hold down space bar and then command and we're going to zoom in. Now I have found things like the zoom engine is not as smooth as it is in Photoshop. You can see it's just a little bit more jerky. It tends to snap. Um, there we go. That snapping could be something that we turn off and on. Mm -hmm. I haven't 
dug deep into the preferences to know that. But the Zoom is just a little bit more clunky. Not not bad, but just a little bit. Uh, we're going to hold Alt or Option to sample an area. And we're going to start painting. Again, I want to make sure here at the top, I choose Current, Layer, and Below. So that's going to be important. It's going to sample my current layer and everything under that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead and sample. And we're just going to start painting in. And you can see as I paint in, we get a little preview of wherever I paint. There we go. Let's go right down here as well. So I'm using the regular healing brush tool here as opposed to the spot healing brush tool. All right. Let's just hit undo, Controller command c to undo that. We're going to sample here and remove this person as well. Okay, that person's gone there. So you can see these tools are working very similarly. Uh, did a pretty good job up until here. Again, just like in Photoshop, I don't want to go all the way because look at this. It's just it's going to give us an undesirable result. So yeah. Let's go ahead and hit undo there. We're going to continue by getting rid of these light posts. And Aaron, while you're doing that, are you noticing any uh, any noticeable responsiveness differences? Like is Photoshop more fluid or faster than Affinity? You know, it's there's just some different user interface things. Like I'm getting a little bit of like a interesting preview as I paint in. Yeah. Um, uh, this area here seems to... There we go. Now it's working a little bit better. Um, it, I, I think the tool actually works uh, j just as fast. You know, I'm on a, I'm on a pretty uh, beefy computer here, so I'm, uh, I, I would be surprised if you know there's much of a difference here. Um, but yeah, I would say you know the, the, the program itself seems pretty well developed. Um, we're gonna make one more layer here for the, for the clone stamp tool. We're gonna go to current layer and below. There we go. And now we're just going to sample. I can use my brush keyboard shortcuts, which I'm used to using in Photoshop with hardness, oh, hardness and flow. There we go. Let's just kind of paint this in. Um, and, you know, for our, for our viewers and for our listeners, this is, I, I downloaded the trial of Affinity Photograph affinity photo um yesterday so oh, wow <laughs> yeah so this <laughs> okay that says a lot right you know this is this is basically you know kind of the first time i've used this program like you know well i did a trial run before i got on air with you because i didn't want to look like i didn't know what i was doing obviously but you know we're not talking about a huge transition time here you know this is this is something where the the tools i mean there's Pretty much a direct transfer of the tools. Even the keyboard shortcuts are uh, are relatively the same, which is which is just a fantastic um, adaptation. And again, I don't know how they got away with that. Like, yeah, know. I wonder. I wonder if you can copyright keyboard shortcuts. I guess <laughs> you, I guess the answer is just no. You can't because or maybe they're in court right now. I don't know. Right? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but as we can see, the, the tools perform, you know, relatively similarly. I, I don't have any issues moving from one tool to another. So I was able, you know, here we're looking at the same exact changes. Uh, let's just turn these off and on using, you know, we've got checkboxes instead of eyeballs here. You know, so some user interface differences here. But I was able to use the healing brush tool to remove these objects here and the clone stamp to remove those objects there. And you know, we're at basically the same, uh, basically the same place we were in Photoshop. So let's go ahead and take a look at our adjustment layers. We have adjustments right here. I'm going to go ahead and click on levels. There we go. Now we've got some uh, preset options here, which is interesting. I can change my color channel. So we're going to go to our blue channel. Okay. Change my black level. We're just going to pull this up. Okay. I actually want to go to the, my output black level. So you can see adjusting my blue channel here, mm -hmm. adjusting my uh, output channel here. And we've got a very similar result here. So let's go to our layers and we can see we have a levels adjustment, which is fantastic. So this level adjustment, we can turn off and on just like we can in Photoshop. 
And let me go ahead and add a mask to this. There we go. Let's uh, right click here. All right, here's our mask. So maybe I just start painting with my brush tool. All right, so we're gonna hit B for the brush tool. There we are. And we're gonna choose our color. So it's a little bit just a little bit of like a user interface change. There we go. This is like getting getting to know the app, right? Once, yeah. Once, once you've done something once and figured it out, uh, then it's kind of in your tool belt at that point, right? Exactly, exactly. So let's go ahead and bring my color swatches out there. There we go. And I'm going to paint black on here. So it is masking this out. I just need to continue to paint black to hide this. Let's go ahead and bring our opacity and flow up. And here we can see our layer mask here. All right, and looks like I'm painting white. So if I paint black on my mask, there we go. It's gonna mask this effect out. Oops, I'm painting on the wrong layer. So you can see I've got a little bit of like a user interface, a um, little bit of a delay. You can see it easier here in the sky. So I'm just painting black on my layer mask, which is hiding this effect. Yeah. Okay. And I swap my color to white. And you can bring it back. You can bring it back. And again, I, I downloaded this program, you know, yesterday. And I actually haven't used adjustment layers uh, yet. So you, you just watched me figure it out for the first time, you know, so, um, you know, <laughs> just to show that like the, the, the change from one program to another is, uh, it's relatively straightforward. I mean, they, like they said, they, they stood on the shoulders of giants and, you know, the majority of the program looks and feels and works very similar to Photoshop. You know, we've yeah. got our, we've got our tools here, on the left-hand side, the tool options are located in this bar along the top. We've got our histograms, swatches, brushes, all of our main menus here, adjustments, layers, effects, and styles. All of these are located here. And then we have our navigator window. We can transform. We have our history and our channels here. So we're not really missing much. Let's go back to our adjustments. We're going to go to a color balance here. There we go. And we'll just see, there we go. Here's color balance. And here we're just going to pull a little bit towards red and a little bit towards yellow. And then back in our layers, we're going to invert our layer mask. So controller command I, I'm going to go to my gradient tool. So this is just going to take me like two seconds to find it. Basically, I'm going to hit G for my gradient tool. And look at that. It's the same exact keyboard shortcut. <laughs> look at that. So G for the gradient tool, uh, same keyboard shortcut, uh, fantastic. So there we go. Let's go to an elliptical gradient there. Okay, there we go. Our gradient is going to be our foreground color. All right, so gradient fill. All right, just gonna take me a slight second or two to figure out um, you know, how to use this tool. This is, this is educational seeing someone that just, someone who's a Photoshop expert and that's just now basically experiencing affinity. How do you get, get around in there? And it, it looks, it looks relatively intuitive. It's, I mean, it, it's pretty dang good. I got, I gotta say, I'm, you know, I'm surprised. And it is, again, you're watching me do this for literally the first time. Yeah. Um, if this was, you know, something where, you know, you, you had this tool and kind of played around with it for a little while. I, I have no doubt that you'd be able to um, do exactly what you needed to do. And you know what's interesting? There's a couple of things I want to throw at you while you're doing that. So the, the, the file format between the Serif applications, because they've got Affinity Designer and, you know, I, I think Publisher. I'm not sure. But they've got a couple of other applications and uh, according to the uh, the managing director, they all share a common file format, even across mobile. So, you know, you, you, if you started working on this file and it had all these layers and adjustment layers, et cetera, 
Um, apparently you can open this exact same file on your lap, on your, your iPad and continue with the, you know, with the feature parity as well as all your layers intact and then, you know, move it over into a desktop computer with Affinity Designer on it and continue working there, adding text and all that stuff and basically eliminating the need to round trip and send files back and forth that way because they're, it's a common file format. It, what, did you know about that? And what do you think about that? I think it's brilliant. And uh, I, you know, I, again, that's where I think the real benefits come, you know, like because they were able to edit, like build the mobile applications at the same time as the desktop applications. Of course, it makes sense to use the exact same file format. You know, Photoshop is all the Photoshop's doing the same thing. You can open PSDs on their mobile application too. So, you know, I, the mobile application for Photoshop just isn't out yet, but it, it will be soon and you'll okay. be able to open PSDs there. But um, yeah, I, I think that they just, they did a lot of things that make sense. And, you know, here when we're using the gradient tool, for instance, and again, this is my first time using the gradient tool, but I actually really like that after you create the gradient, you can go in and change this gradient um, after making it. I'm even able to change it from a linear gradient to an elliptical gradient, and I'm able to change the ellipse in this gradient in, in real time, uh, which is something that actually Photoshop cannot do. Oh, so, interesting. yeah, let's go ahead back to here and, uh, yeah, check out my gradient. Well, I guess you got to kind of make it, but there we go. I can change the, uh, there we go. I can change the gradient itself, change the colors on the gradient, go from black to white, yeah. as well as change the type of gradient uh, here in real time and continue to make adjustments to it which I think is actually a fantastic adaptation. That is, that is fantastic. And that, you know, it, it's interesting. That's a, that's an example of, you know, the, uh, like they said, standing on the shoulders of giants and being able to, okay, well maybe what if we did this feature like this, you know, listening, I know Adobe's famous for listening to users and, you know, but they're giant, right? And they're the yes. user base, you know, you can only, you're never going to make everyone happy, you know? Right, <laughs> right, make, right. You know? Yeah. So. so Affinity, you know, they, they had a little bit of a leg up. You know, they started mm -hmm. out like, of course, we're going to have a gradient tool in this. How can we make this a little bit cooler? Oh, let's allow people to edit the gradient after they make it. You know what I mean? Whereas Photoshop had to come up with the idea of the gradient tool and how that would work with layers and adjustment layers. So, you know, it's it's a really interesting evolution, I would say, in, in products. Now, I, I wouldn't say that Affinity Photo makes Photoshop inferior in any way, but just like you said, they were able to take something that already existed and was already working well and then figure out how they could basically clone stamp it and then try to improve on it a little bit. So, um, yeah, they're, they're in a good spot. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy that there is a legitimate competitor out there and it seems like the pricing is what's going to keep Affinity Photo around because I know a lot of people are, you know, not necessarily into the subscription products or subscription models in general. So especially for those individuals, I think Affinity Photo is a great alternative. I love it. I love it. And why not, right? Give it, give it a shot, download it and play around with it. And, and see if it sort of meshes with the way you like to do stuff. And I think that one of the big takeaways from this discussion, and thank you for those demos, that was fantastic. Um, but one of, the, one of the big takeaways is there's nothing to lose if, to, to playing around with it. In the end, it's about your art and the path of least resistance to getting from here to the pixel. So if, if money is an issue, I'm not sure, I forget what the pricing is for Affinity, but you plunk that down once and get your teeth into it and start playing around. And if you find it necessary later, you know, the next step might be just move into Photoshop when you can afford it or it makes sense if you hit some walls in there. One of the, one of the questions I had about, um, and I know we can't address it right now, but one of the, the questions about affinity is I know some photographers that are, uh, you know, especially compositing artists that work in a gazillion bazillion layers, right? Uh, nested layers and all this stuff going on. I wonder, I know Photoshop and the folks over at Adobe have, you know, put a lot of work into performance and making sure it can keep up with those sorts of heavy, heavy workload tasks and giant documents. I wonder if Affinity can handle that. 
and especially can it handle that on an, on a mobile processor you know so that that would be interesting and it's uh, likely the same the same question goes to photoshop on tablets can photoshop on a tablet handle 50 100 you know layers you know, because I'm, I'm sure you've, you've got documents like that, Aaron. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely do. And that's a good question. You know, we're doing relatively simple edits here. But, yeah, I've, I've worked, you know, uh, Photoshop files that have, you know, anywhere from 100 to 200 layers of very, very complex uh, photo composites. And, uh, you know, it, it would be interesting to see how these other programs are formed under such a heavy workload. Um, and at the end of the day, it, it may just be, you know, how how, you know, beefed up your computer hardware is. Uh, yeah. For Photoshop in particular, I find that, you know, having a very fast scratch disk and having a lot of RAM will increase Photoshop's performance. So if you are experiencing any lags, those are some great ways to do it. In fact, we actually just released a tutorial on Flurn called How to Improve Photoshop Performance. And uh, we did all the research to figure out every single way in which you can save file size and you know, get the most out of Photoshop. And we're, we were able to increase Photoshop performance uh, pretty substantially just with a bunch of like little tips and hacks, and things like that. So um, I, I wonder, you know, what Affinity Photo or these other competitors are doing to, in, you know, increase performance. But Photoshop does take advantage of things like your graphics card handles some of the processes. So you're, you know, you're able to rely on different parts of your computer to get different parts of the job done, which spreads out the workload and increases performance. Yeah. No, I love that. Okay. And if people want to check out that tutorial or, and, and you're, you're, you kind of have two sides of your house over there or multiple sides, obviously, but, but two big sides where there's the, the free YouTube stuff that people can go and consume ad nauseum there's a mountain <laughs> a literal mount everest of content over there then you also have paid tutorials where you deep dive into some of the stuff that you're you kind of scratch the surface on on the youtube site where are both of those or is there a roam where all flurn le roads lead here <laughs> yeah flurn.com and uh we actually have a subscription platform as well so Fant the huge advantage of subscription learning is that basically you pay your annual fee and you get access to every single tutorial, Lightroom presets, Photoshop actions, uh, Photoshop brushes, every single asset that you would need to really jumpstart your education. We also teach photography as well as Lightroom. Everything is included in the annual fee. So it's a fantastic way. You know, let's say you want an introduction to Photoshop education. And then from there, you're like, you know what? I think my portraits could use some work. You could learn professional retouching. Or maybe I want to get a little bit more creative with things. You can learn professional compositing. So really anywhere you want to go, it's all included in one package. So you get all of Flurn with one subscription. I love it. And it's all located at flurn.com if they want to hop over there and poke around and, and get access to both the free training and the the the, the subscription, et cetera. Right. Yeah. So that's phlearn.com. Yep. And I'll put that in the blog post and it'll have been on the screen here. Go there now and check it out. <laughs> I've been, I've, I've been, uh, I've been, you know, like man crush stalking you for like a decade <laughs> now, man. So you, you are, you are the Holy grail in content creation in terms of your, your learning style or your teaching style, uh, your attention to detail and the production level of all the stuff that you guys put out over there. I mean, as evidence, let me just put the camera on you as evidence by the fantastic set that you have going on there. So congratulations <laughs> on all that, man. That is, that is fantastic. You guys set the bar in a lot of ways for, you know, the way that this stuff should be done. So, and we all appreciate that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, Aaron, before, before I let you go, um, you know, I, I try to, twist the arms of, of most of my guests that have cool content sites to get free stuff out of them. Anything <laughs> that you want to throw at the TWIP audience? <laughs> yeah, we've actually got a special discount code for you uh, for flurn.com, your annual subscription. Enter in TWIP20, that's T-W-I-P 20 at checkout. And you'll save 20 per... Uh, can I say that again? Yep. All right. Um, I'll just... Do you want to lead me in or should I just yeah. start it again? Yeah, I'll lead you in one more time. You ready? Okay. Yep. Here we go. All right, Aaron, before before I let you go, you know, I know you may be braced for this, but I try to squeeze some some freebies out of most of my guests <laughs> when they come on the show. Uh, anything you want to throw down and kick over to the TWIP audience before I let you go? 
Yeah, for sure. We actually have a 20% discount exclusive to the TWIP audience. This is for an annual Flurn Pro subscription, which gives you access to everything on Flurn.com. So all you have to do is enter coupon code TWIP, T-W-I-P 20, the number 20, so T-W-I-P 20 during checkout, and you'll save 20% on your Flurn Pro annual subscription. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks so much for having me on. This is Twitter.